With a slight introduction of myself, somewhat unusual for me, I'm actually now 97 years old. I was born in 1914 in the west of England town called Bristol, where I was educated right through to university in which I graduated with honours degrees in 1930s. In 1933, studying German, I went to Freiburg University in the Black Forest, and 1933 was the year Hitler came to power. So I was in at the very beginning. I saw the Nazis in their uniform, I saw books being burnt, I saw windows being smashed. I returned to England and reported to the Chancellor of my university, whose name was Winston Churchill, what I had seen. And he sympathised, told me his opinions, and asked me to keep in touch. In 1935, he gave me my final degree, honours degree in Bristol University, and I joined the army some years later knowing there was to be a war with Hitler, so I volunteered. Having reached officer's rank, I was serving in India when a mysterious body called Station X semi-kidnapped me and brought me to a place called Bletchley Park in England, which was the home of the codebreakers a mysterious place unknown to everybody and anybody associated had to swear a complete and final oath never to reveal anything about code breaking or Bletchley all through the war and for 30 years after. That's why my first book, Germany's Fourth Reich, was written well after the 1970s. As a code breaker instead of an artillery officer, my job was to break German code ciphers and signals as they came in from our various stations. When Rommel invaded Egypt, I was flown out to Cairo to break Rommel's ciphers, which I continued to do for General Montgomery until our victory in El Alamein, the first victory of World War II. After the desert campaign, I was sent back to India and into Burma to work with the 14th Army in breaking Japanese codes which I continued to do until the end of the war in 1945 when I returned home. Foreign Office then sent me to Germany and my task was to resuscitate the German universities of the Rhineland, namely Cologne and Bonn. And there I worked for four years as head of those two universities, repairing or seen to the repair of war damage and denazification and setting them up as democratic institutes with the aid of other people from America, France and uh, a few from Denmark. After the war, I got married and moved into a huge county called Yorkshire it, where I had to work for a living because I'd fallen from grace and got married and started a family. I also began my first independent school near York. My experiences in Germany led me to begin writing my stories of the truth of what happened over there and my experiences with the Nazis 
and their followers. However, in 1972, when Ted Heath made a terrible decision to join the European Union, which was then under the pseudonym of Common Market, I decided that I had to turn my energies against such events and since then I've been working as hard as possible to reveal the truth about what went on in Germany before, during the war and ever since. And today I will reveal to you some of my latest findings. Now in my 98th year, this may be my last essay on enlightenment, so I must begin with sincere thanks to all my correspondents worldwide who keep me informed, especially my friends of the Philadelphia Trumpet, one Christian journal with untiring meticulous probing worldwide for truth, that rare commodity in today's world, whom I happily quote from here on. My talk is going to be divided into two main parts. The first is to discuss the European Union the special coinage called the Euro and its probable fate. And the second part will be to introduce you eventually to the man I think may well become the new Führer of Germany, not yet broadcast to the world. So I should be offering you something new. The euro was introduced this century by Germany's European Union, founded by Germany with such panache. It marks the greatest disastrous upheaval in Europe. First Greece, now Ireland, to be followed by most of the other 27 members. The EU has unwisely enrolled almost everybody who wanted to join, large and small, all now suffering similar tragic fate as Greece and Ireland. To be followed by, most likely, Spain, Portugal and Italy. They are all in advanced stages of semi-bankruptcy, no longer able to help themselves by printing their own money because they are tied by the hip, having traded their own money and perfect rights for the euro, full of fairy promises, as one coin fits all. A major, major deception. Only Germany stands out as sole exception. Why? The Germans recover quickly from any debacle. Certainly from the recent financial crisis which hit America as well as Europe. By taking immediate action slashing overall cuts and closures, reducing wages, increasing taxation, all accepted by the German people, remembering the Weimar catastrophe which brought hyperinflation and the wipeout of the German currency. The result of this immediate action by Germany brought lower exchange rates, 
Lower exchange rates usually spell increased exports. Increased exports bring rising employment and the dynamic concentration of the Germans made the country the wealthy powerhouse of Europe, while the rest of Europe slides heedlessly into semi-bankruptcy. Yet, way back in the 1930s, it was the German elite, the people hidden at the head of the country, who planned the European Union back in the 1930s with a sole currency to bind everything together. These plans were continued later by a man called Walter Funk, who was Hitler's economics minister, with his Europäische Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft, which means the economic community. He proposed changing the single currency of the Reichsmark. That's the first time the single currency is mentioned for Europe. This was enshrined later in what was called the Treaty of Rome, followed by a treaty called Maastricht, because that's the town it was signed in. Leading our mesmerized leaders step by step into the German hidden master plan, following Lenin's doctrine of gain and succeed, but by deceit. And they became masters of deceit. Thus shaping the European Union, European Union, Europe's unelected hidden heat leaders, the German elite's house of cards, because that's what the EU has turned out to be, a house of cards, whose accounts illegally extracted from members of the European Union, extorted by threats with outrageous cheating, continuously have never been audited in 14 years or balanced. In fact, all qualified accountants have refused to balance those books year after year for the 14 years of the European Union. The first referendums brought resounding refusals by all people permitted of France, Holland, Ireland, Denmark to vote for or against the European Union. They all voted no. But the European Union leaders refused to accept the no. So they were all forced to vote again. Illegally. Until they gave a yes reply. That was an evil mockery, impossible to comprehend, of refusing to accept the moti vote of all the people. History will eventually reveal the farce of all this stupendous racket seen through by the peoples permitted to vote in referendums whilst their leaders weakly betrayed their own trusting people.
By 1955, ten years only after her greatest total crushing defeat, Germany gained permission to reconstitute a civilian-based Bundeswehr armed services because of America's fear at that time of a Cold War Russian communist uprising and invasion. But, as always, seizing this opportunity, Germany swiftly rebuilt and re-equipped her armed people's forces, admitting also to NATO as a new member. She quickly renewed all her pre-war successes, including the Balkans. In 18, 1989, East Germany overthrew their communist regime. If you remember, the Berlin Wall fell in 1989 and Germany became reunited as a complete entity, just as Thatcher and others worst fears. So here was Germany, now once again a bona fide world power, with leading arms and munitions exports with her own standing army of some 300,000, the largest in Europe, by continuous, ruthless maneuvering. In 1995, in Parliament, Prime Minister Thatcher thundered, you have anchored Europe to a newly dominant, unified Germany. It will not work, not for us, but certainly it has for Germany. Now, extricably bound together by Germany's European Union, the rest of Europe, also inextricably, slithers into further debt crisis of semi-bankruptcy, unable to compete at Euro fixed exchange rates, granted begrudgingly aid to Greece and Ireland, but under strict German conditions, including help from others, especially Britain, contributing some 7 billion, although not a member of the Euro, to help her friend Ireland, which money, Britain, now totally in debt, must borrow at high interest rates to increase her own costs. Oh, for the days of Mr. Micawber, how to save money rather than waste. However, the thrifty German people, fearing more outpourings to come for Spain, Portugal, Italy and the remainder, now began to grumble at such unaccountable outpourings and they clamoured for return of their own trusted Deutschmark. Easy perhaps for Germany to do, but what fate for all the remainder? <clears throat> the German Supreme Court brought in a new law with the Bundestag Parliament, which totally limited Brussels and the European Court of Justice to have any control over German sovereignty still had held fully intact. 
all new ventures from Brussels must now first gain approval of the German court. Germany's total master play. So Germany no longer needs the Euro or EU regulations and can now dictate further conditions, dispensing, if she will, with weaker members of the European Union. It has taken 20 years of determined drive and planning by German elite to reach total mastery of Europe since the collapse of the Berlin Wall brought Prime Minister Kohl and his unification of Germany. By December 2009, Germany became the leading European economy, leading export nation, leading financial power, and the strongest political force with expanding military power actively engaged outside its own borders, although forbidden in 1955. Now Germany is vying with China as the world's top exporters. And the Lisbon Treaty Constitution now enables the creation of a pan-European army directly under German control. My first publication of year 2002 to 3 was called Germany's Four Reichs. It forecasts the present impasse, which you will find on pages 56 and 64, the end page, giving you an indication of how I saw what was going to happen in Germany with the creation not only of the EU, but of the ill-fated Europe, the Euro, which has suddenly collapsed, I think was pre-planned so to do, with something else in mind to follow, but that we have to seek to find. But should you wish, you may download it from Google under Harry Beckhoff. Okay. Thus, the German elite have accomplished their far forward planning in sequence. But what are their next plans? Do they revert to the D mark now as their people request, leaving the euro to founder? As I mentioned, I think, originally planned because the Euro never had a firm foundation, never had its own treasury. Has it now therefore served its purpose? Or will they now select a quorum of leading EU members to accompany them aboard their next stage of world conquest, leaving their house of cards to collapse. A reminder comes to mind. In 1997, I heard the speech of Joschka Fischer, ex-communist, become leader of Germany's Green Party saying, Germany needs not democracy, but a system of statecraft similar to Soviet dictatorship, enabling the German political and military elite. First time I heard anybody in Germany actually mention the word elite 
which I did mention in my beginning as a hidden number of people who have directed events behind the scenes. So, says Joschka Fischer, the communist, Germany needs a system of statecraft similar to Soviet dictatorship, enabling the German political and military elite to organize Europe's industrial capacity and the military qualities of the German people with the revival of the German race. Europe, said he, is just an extension of Germany. Lenin's scheme was destroy the nation state by collective merging of all nations. What would that entail? By merging all nations together, you deprive them of their individual sovereignty. The Maastricht Treaty deprived the EU nation states, including Britain, of key elements of sovereignty, currency, internal and external security, losing citizens' freedom of movement and our security of British common law. Germany, now gaining global power, global power, seeks world domination. Ever their wish through the centuries to dominate Europe, now they want to go beyond and seek world domination. While we foolishly again reduce our armed forces piece by piece against all the arguments and advice of military leaders. The, our leaders are also reducing the armor and equipment as well as membership of our armed forces. But Germany is building hers more and more to outmatch the whole world. Plus, her further plan of a projected European army and EU forces combined, based on what? German United States of Europe. That's the plan with concept of a super state, thus establishing a new German Reich. Having so accomplished, they would then abandon the useless Euro for return to the D-Mark for the whole of this new Reich, which includes us. German control of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt makes her dictator of the European superstate without firing a single shot. This heading is of much more interest to many people called the Bavarian influence on Germany. Munich, the capital of Bavaria, was Hitler's Nazi recruiting, training and assembly base. With foreign and home capital financing the whole enterprise, especially from American banks. Munich was also the least denazified post-war, leaving its 
families to carry on tradition. A man called Franz Joseph Strauss, F.J. Strauss, post-war premier of Bavaria, was famed as Germany's strong man. He led them away from their traditional aggressive actions to a totally different Lenin-like tactics of deceit, humbly seeking forgiveness, full of contrition, as fully detailed in my book, Germany's Four Reich, until they were permitted back within the grieving, suffering, victorious enclaves. Thus, accompanying Lenin-like deceit. Strauss's Lenin-like tactics of deception, succeeding surprisingly well, even arousing sympathetic help and major contributions, he now mentored his Bavarian successor, President Edmund Stoiber as replacement chancellor for Germany. But outgoing Chancellor Schroeder's intervention won that place for Angela Merkel as the new chancellor of Germany. Stoibert, however, continued as president of Bavaria turning it into a rich and prosperous Christian Social Union state. His party, the Christian Social Union, now became part of Merkel's coalition, and Stoibert began to mentor his general secretary of CSU, a young, upcoming politician who had recently become Minister of Defence, top job in Germany. His name, listen carefully, Baron Karl Theobald II Gutenberg, of whom more, much more later. Now, in addition to this dynastic Catholic trio of Franz Josef Strauss, Edmund Stoibert and Karl Theobard zu Gutenberg, there emerges a fourth powerful Bavarian, one Joseph Ratzinger, Have you heard of him? He is now Pope Benedict XVI. And all four of these Bavarians are dedicated to Roman Catholicism within Bavaria, its heartland. The German Pope Benedict is the archetypal German conservative right-wing, articulate leader with matching curia, revising the Holy Roman Empire tradition in a strong effort to bind imperial Europe together. Benedict's own great desire is to move the Vatican to Jerusalem as biblical shrine which Rome ever seeks to possess, thus bringing, they think, peace on earth in the thousand-year Reich beginning 2010. 
So we come to my final heading of Germany's prospective new Führer. It has been a long, aggressive journey for Germany with their fierce, warlike ancestors, the Assyrians, eventually bringing down Rome and swarming into Europe. <coughs> Until King Pepin's son Charlemagne, King of the Franks, twice rescued Pope Leo III around 800 AD, he was rewarded by crowning as first Holy Roman Emperor. He then sought to weld all those aggressive Germani tribes together into the faith by Blut und Eisen, flowing blood and steel. <coughs> by the way, you might be interested to learn that the German name was actually given them by the Romans, who called them the Germani, the warlike people. How right they were. From Charlemagne's first Reich, his successor continued their aggressive ways until King Frederick and Chancellor Otto von Bismarck's Second Reich, bringing Germany with her amalgamation into a federal state with the first Prussian army, soon into battle, defeating France within a few weeks in 1870. Now Hitler's Third Reich eventually founded in his World War II bloodthirsty attempt to conquer Europe, defeated by their invincible old enemy, the United Kingdom and Commonwealth, who stood alone from 1930-40 until somewhat reluctantly joined by their old ally of America in 1942 after her Pearl Harbor losses by Hitler's Japanese ally. Since 1945, Germany has won her way back to acceptance within a few short 10 years because of America's fears of communist Russia's Cold War, they were able to reconstitute their forces, but only as civilian conscripts, a civilian army for defense only within her borders. That was laid down very carefully in 1955. How long would it last? Now, finally, emerges Germany's new strongman at the Ministry of Defence. Born in Munich in 1971, he is Baron Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg. And there is a picture available of him. His aristocratic family tree goes back 800 years and he lives in Borg Gutenberg, Franken, the family headquarters since 1482. His full title of Reichsfreiherr makes him Baron of the Holy Roman Empire. In February 2000, he married out of the faith, unusual for Catholics, a distinguished Lutheran called Stephanie, 
Countess von Bismarck, Schönhausen, directly descended from Otto von Bismarck, Germany's Iron Chancellor. In Germany, the aristocratic caste remains extremely strong, dominating both the officers' corps of the Reichswehr and also the Wehrmacht. <clears throat> the aristocratic elite has played a leading role in German history, of whom you heard me speak in the beginning in the plotting and planning. So Gutenberg received a tumultuous welcome to his chosen command, having already done his military service. Karl Theodor, as he is called, has somewhat star appeal, especially as a celebrity in his own right, and the German youth call him KT, the Rocking Baron. So you see, he is quite active as well. But his aim is to build a United States of Europe under German command and on a par with his global economic weight where might is right. He is connected to the historic House of Habsburg, ancient rulers. Add his family title, cementing all together, and here is my man to watch as future Führer, more cultured and educated and aristocratic than Hitler. However, there are moments of interest to us, especially in recent family history. His grandfather, Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg, same name, resisted the Nazis and later became German foreign minister in 1960. His great-great-uncle, Karl Ludwig Freiherr von und zu Gutenberg, hated Hitler and became part of the plot to kill him. Caught by the Gestapo and tortured to death, he steadily refused to name any of his accomplices, which gives us a somewhat different outlook. Karl Theodor actually led the Christian Social Union on foreign policy. He is trying to swing the German population back into a military mindset again, with a strong following and popularity with the young, and especially with the Bundeswehr, whom he seeks to transform into a professional military. In fact, he first proposes to reduce the Bundeswehr from present 250,000 approximately down to about 160,000, all to be in professional service, not People's Army. Conscription as such will be dispensed with immediately to be replaced by volunteers for professional service only. In short, the old professional service military forbidden by Churchill and Roosevelt's edict 
in 1945-46, when they said Germany should never be able to rearm as military again. Now, under Theodor Gutenberg, the Bundeswehr will seek to act beyond the German borders to anywhere in the world with permission to make war when necessary. He seeks a new political strategy of combined efforts of EU leaders to create a mixed assembly of all services under German command to be supported by an international police force able to operate in every country. When fully established under largely German command and German organization, which we know well, this harbors ill for the fate of the nations of Europe. The Germans have, as always, been expanding the deployment of their military force and forces around the world, retooling their heavy industry to produce greater volumes of armaments, military machines, ships, submarines and aircraft to prepare for the new structure of the combined military force. The Lisbon Treaty is really the constitution for a revived European empire. But who rules? The German Constitutional Court and Bundestag recently rushed through a new law recognizing the German law as trumping the EU law, giving Germany legal, political and economic power within Europe, never gained previously by military aggression. Backed by an ever compliant, supportive cabal of industrialists, with a powerful cadre of military officers, Gutenberg will dominate Germany as never before. Gutenberg aims eventually to develop a strong military presence from the North Sea to the Persian Gulf, from Gibraltar to the Caucasus, with Pope Benedict building his own rule within his own sway. And that, my friends, is my portrait of this young aristocratic leader, already most popular in Germany, building his blocks as base for forthcoming leadership of Germany and Europe.